Welcome everyone to Buddha's Center. My name is Jeff Allen and tonight once again we are going over bodhicitta uh, according to Penchen Sun Andrapa's general meaning and perfection section on the awakening mind. Uh, so just another wonderful occasion to try to get a really comprehensive understanding of bodhicitta using some technical terms but not really using too many terms we haven't heard before just being able to get a really full picture of it by using Pension Sun Andrapa's outline. We'll get into that in a moment. But before we get started, let's do what we always do. Uh, let's set a motivation. Let's first get into a physical posture. Uh, that's an intentional posture uh, for us to go into this session. Uh, we call it the seven point Virakana posture. We've gone over it quite a few times, uh, but we'll just go over the basics. We put our legs into a cross-legged fashion as best we can, preferably full lotus, but whatever our physical uh, abilities are, we push it to whatever, you know, the, you know, the limit of what we can do is, and then we don't try to push it beyond that because that's not possible if we have physical limitations, but we get our legs into that cross-legged style, straighten our back like a stack of coins, have our hands in our lap with our thumbs touching, right touching left, right hand on top of the left hand, uh, with this uh, making this diamond uh, uh, posture, this diamond mudra, if you will. Uh, um, so we have, it's not called the diamond mudra, but it's you're putting your, your thumbs in a diamond style. So you have your legs, your hands, and your back uh, making three, your shoulders making four, your head slightly tilted, making five, your eyes slightly pointed, uh, downward, slightly open, not open uh, um, too much, um, and focusing kind of on the tip of the nose. And what we're trying to do is get our, uh, meant our, our eye consciousness to eventually just shut down. And we're going to be focusing on the objects of observation with our mental consciousness. Uh, so we're focusing uh, um, just to have a focal point for it to be able to kind of fade away uh, on the tip of the nose or just in front of the tip of the nose. Uh, and then we're going to have our mouth in a kind of a comfortable position, not clenched tight uh, with our tongue on the top of our roof, uh, top roof of our mouth against our teeth. Uh, and so that makes for seven points. And then sometimes they say the eight points and the eighth point is the breath. So uh, we'll breathe in and out uh, and let's focus only on the breath and the counting of the breath to try to get our minds to a more realistic place, a more neutral place from which we can build uh, some sort of aspiration and positive uh, growth from. Uh, so let's leave all of the conceptual attachments and conceptual aversions and so forth uh, outside. Uh, and let's be in this posture, breathing, focusing with our mind on the breath and the counting of the breath. And we'll do that for uh, just a little bit. Let's begin thinking about the various types of suffering that we have to endure. Those very sufferings are the reasons why we generally enter into a Buddhist class or pick up a Buddhist book on Buddhism. The dissatisfaction that we have with our present condition, the sadness that we feel when we lose people, how awful we feel when we're in pain, we have sickness. We recognize that we will have to die. We don't know when. We think about the fact that when we actually die, if we still have attachment, will be forced into another set of aggregates. We won't have a choice in which ones they are. 
and no matter what kind of aggregates or parts we take on in cyclic existence, whatever body our mind is forced into, we'll have to endure suffering again. And there's this cycle of being forced into a set of aggregates again and again and again at, in, a, in a fashion that is out of our control, meaning we don't have any independence on where we're going to be, re be reborn at this point because we haven't practiced enough. And we could be born into a hell realm, a hungry ghost realm, an animal realm, or a human again. And think about all the sufferings that we have to endure as a human. Think about the fact that even if we're born as a demigod or a god, even if we reach the peak of existence, we're still in cyclic existence and we'll have to suffer again. And this recognition of suffering and this distaste we have for suffering leads us to want to know why it happens. The Buddha first stated that this is the superior truth of suffering and outlined the various types of suffering we have to endure, specifically the pervasive compounded suffering. And then the Buddha pointed out what the causes of all of our sufferings are. The Buddha stated that it was our grasping at things as being truly established, that ignorance that caused us to have these afflictions and contaminated karmas that forced us again and again and again into the situation that we're in. The Buddha stated that we could end all of this if we wanted to, and we applied a path. superior truth of cessation, and this is the superior truth of path. The Buddha stated that in dependence upon a path that a superior being understood, one could be free from cyclic existence. So we recognize that there is a solution to our problem. There's a way that we can become fearless. We go for refuge because of fear of cyclic existence, fear of the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change and pervasive compounded suffering. And if we follow the path that the Buddha taught, we no longer have to have any of those fears ever again. None of those things will ever occur again, according to Buddha, if we practice a path. And we start to think about other sentient beings and the predicament that they are in just like us and that they want to have happiness. They don't want to have suffering just like us. We look at our close friends and relatives and think about, oh, I would love for them to be happy. Just like I want to be happy. And how nice it would be if they were free from suffering too. When we start to apply that same mode of thinking to strangers and then eventually our enemies. We recognize that our friends, enemies, and neutrals all have played all of those roles in our rebirth since beginningless time. They, every friend we have has been our enemy and a stranger. Every stranger we have in our lives has been a friend and an enemy, and every enemy has been a friend and a stranger. Everyone we see as an enemy is someone who's been as kind as the kindest person to us in our most vulnerable time in a previous life. And we start to want them to have happiness and be free from suffering, just like we want for ourselves. And we think how nice it would be if they were 
had happiness, the causes of happiness, and were free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May they be. I'll bring them there. And then we recognize that we are in the same exact predicament as they are. And we can't bring them somewhere we haven't been. We can't bring them to somewhere we aren't. And if we don't know how they will get to where they need to go, we can't show them. If we don't know how they need to get where they need to go, we can't show them. We recognize that the Buddha stated that the only way that a being could have infinite happiness was by having infinite love and infinite compassion and by becoming a Buddha. So now we recognize if we want to be free from fear and we want infinite happiness, we have to become a Buddha. If we want to help all sentient beings in a really, really skillful way, in a way that has no error, we have to become Buddhas. So then we look at how would that happen? How would we become a Buddha? We think about it. What would it take to become a Buddha? Luckily, there are Buddhas. And specifically, Buddha Shakyamuni, who presented a very, very clear pathway in the sutras. And the Indian pandits clarified and presented a very clear pathway, the, the very clear pathway that Buddha Shakyamuni presented. And then all of the commentaries in the Tibetan tradition and the English tradition that we find all allow us to understand what we have to do in order to become a Buddha. Luckily, we have this framework. Luckily, we have these texts that show us the stages of the path necessary uh, to become a Buddha. And we want to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. Because this is the only way we can have infinite happiness. And the only way that they can have infinite happiness is if they become Buddhas. So the Buddha stated that we had to achieve the wisdom arisen from hearing, analysis, and meditation. So here we are this evening trying to achieve the wisdom arisen from hearing, analysis, and then eventually meditation. We have to first hear this Dharma and then analyze it, check it, make sure that it saturates our mind. And the only way that we can do that is to have it presented to us, read it, listen to it, think about it. So it's for the reason of becoming a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings that we are here this evening listening to the Dharma, reciting the Dharma, and thinking about the Dharma. And as we recite these prayers, we should think about their deep meanings. So now let's recite the Heart Sutra. The Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard, once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagriha at Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a great gathering of the Sangha of monks and a great gathering of the Sangha of Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called Profound Illumination. And at the same time, Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, while practicing the Profound Prajnaparamita, saw in this way, he saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Noble Avogateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, 
How should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita? Addressed in this way, noble Abhulgateshvar, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice the profound Prajnaparamita should see in this way. Seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Form is emptiness, emptiness also is form. Emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth and no cessation. There is no impurity and no purity. There is no decrease and no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye, datu, up to no mind, datu, no datu of dharmas, no mind consciousness, datu, no ignorance, no end of ignorance, up to an old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non-attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajnaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajnaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajnaparamita, the mantra of great insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth since there is no deception. The Prajnaparamita mantra is said in this way. Te ata om gate gate para gate para sangate bodhisoha. Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound Prajnaparamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that samadhi and praised Noble Abhukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, thus it is, O son of noble family, thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajnaparamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra and Noble Abhukateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Osoras, and Gandharvas rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Gala jube ne jo damba ne nguje do jo nga yi do do jandro babo la ma yi bu jin zi ne zong gandro zo la jadze lo aga zamara te jandara zamara e beos. Agasamara de Janara Zamara, the other on Gatekati Paragati Parasangati Botizo, Baba Conches and Jigai, the Medoji, Loba Doji, Mebodoji, Shiva Doji, Dragi Bajimet, and Vishatan Jen and Gorizoa, Gerin Don Jaja Jushiwada, Medun, Nubej and Andrewada, and Dumbadun Jim Bonzon Zonjoji, Tashi de Jan de Lejo. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love, and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready, a shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide.
I send forth this jewel mandala to you, precious Guru. Idam Guru Radha Mandala Gamye Radha Yamni Sanjye Jadam Jadye Janam La Janju Badu Danye Jazu Jye Dagi Jye Jye Bezo Nanjye Rala Benjye Sanjye Jubajo Sanjye Jadam Jadye Janam La Janju Badu Danye Jazu Jye Dagi Jye Jye Bezo Nanjye Trala benji zanje du bajo zanje ju dan zje ju nala janju badu danje ju zje dagi ju je ju bezo nanje trala benji zanje du bajo. The one who is transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings. The teacher Sugata and protector to you, I make prostrations. The one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations and is endowed with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, who eternally shines forth the forever noble light rays, to you, Buddha, I make prostration. Inspired by wisdom and compassion, today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind of full awakening to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings understand and hear this teaching in their individual languages. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming uh, on this Thursday night to hear some of the most important information you can ever hear in your life. Um, because we know that we want to be free from fear. Uh, we want to have complete happiness, not 10% or 20% happiness. We want 100% happiness, the most happiness that uh, one can experience. Uh, and by attending a class like this, hearing this information, applying this information to our mind, uh, we are creating the causes for that to occur. Uh, and there aren't that many things that we can do in this life uh, that will create causes for us to become an omniscient being. Uh, so whenever we run into, by the force of our wonderful karma, the chance to meet with teachings on bodhicitta, the chance to meet with teachings on emptiness, on the Four Noble Truths, on uh, any of these things that really can mature our minds and turn our minds from this contaminated mind that I, I, we presently have or I presently have into a pure mind that no longer has any afflictive obstructions or obstructions to omniscience, none of the cognitive obstructions that impede us from being, keep us from being Buddhas will remain and they will no longer remain because of what we're doing right now and the application of what we're doing right now. There's no way to apply something you haven't learned. There's no way to make something saturate your mind that you haven't heard before or learned before. So it's so important to have a full understanding of these things if we want to have the full benefits that these things produce. Uh, if we want to have impartial results, then we can have an impartial teaching. But if we want to have the full results and we want to have everything that the Buddha promised us that we could have, we have to do everything the Buddha promised us we will have to do. The Buddha never said there was a shortcut. The Buddha never said that it was some easy system that he was presenting. The Buddha actually said, this is so profound, I don't know if there's anyone who can understand this and I and I'll retire to the forest. <laughs> That's what the Buddha, you know, said out loud and luckily beings requested the Buddha to teach. Uh, but the Buddha recognized that this system that he was presenting was going to go against the grain of how we think, going to be uncomfortable. We were going to have to make decisions that went against kind of our drives and that our intentions all had to be changed. Uh, because the Buddha said that it was our intentions and the, our motivations that were all driving our kind of physical actions, you know, our verbal and, and our, our, our physical actions. Uh, and that the, all of these things were being pushed around by this mind and the intentions of this mind. Uh, so the Buddha said that the mind and the harnessing in of the mind was so much harder than just stopping certain behaviors or stopping saying certain things because of consequences, because it was so much more subtle. But the Buddha said that if we didn't deal with the driver, then the car would keep running. 
and it would be running amok if the driver didn't become a very, very good driver. If it was a crazy monkey driving the car, it'd be it, like our mind is, you know, right now, a crazy monkey mind. Uh, the car would be going all over the road and so forth. And that's what's going on now uh, in, in our minds. And the Buddha knew this about our minds. Uh, the, the Buddha knew uh, that it was going to take a lot to get this thing on track. And the Buddha knew that it was the whole thing, that the mind was the whole thing, that all of the external environment uh, could, could, could move around and go on, but it was the mind's reaction to the external environment that was creating karma, that was creating this intention, this reaction, uh, this way of reacting to a feeling, right? Chasing after things that we attach, pushing away things we don't like, uh, and then having to dwell in dissatisfaction of not getting what we want or having to be in what we don't like. And that all of the external world that we were reacting to could never be put under control, could never be everything that, that we think it should be. We could never tame everything outside of us that we could only tame this mind and how we saw it, how we perceived it, how we reacted to it, and, and how we if we held it to have some solid inherent existence from its own side or not, if we felt we have some solid inherent I from our own side that's reacting to this stuff that has this inherent existence from its own side that we don't have any kind of play in. And when we start to study the mind and start to study the truths, we find that we are in complete control of how we perceive this world, or we can be in complete control of how we perceive this world. Uh, and that is what we have to do if we want to start in, stop reacting in ways uh, that cause us to suffer over and over again. Um, we have to get a more realistic understanding of the way things are happening around us. Uh, and the Buddha taught that understanding that would allow us to then be more sensible in our reactions, be more sensible in our thinking, and eventually not have to suffer ever again or experience the consequences of our perpetual negative actions and our perpetual negative experiences that those perpetual negative actions were creating. Uh, and these contaminated happinesses that the little bit of goods we do were creating that had to go away over and over and over again. And baiting us into thinking everything was okay, and then we find out it's not. And then we find some little form of happiness that baits us into thinking cyclic assistance is okay, we don't need to study for a while, and then we figure out that it's not. Uh, so we keep trying to, as great Geshe always said, you know, get this honey. But the problem is, is that the honey is sitting on the tip of a razor blade. So when we go to lick it, it tastes really sweet at first, and we get that sweet taste, but then it cuts us because it's just bait for cyclic existence. It's just the sweetness that's tricking us into entering a cell that locks behind us. And that is what we have to figure out. So it's by attending a class like this that we can start to figure out why is it that I have to suffer over and over again? Why is it that the happiness that I have doesn't really seem like happiness in the end? And if what the Buddha is saying is true, and if, if beginningless lives are true, and, and this infinite future consciousness is true, then I'll have to do this again, unless I figure out what's causing it to occur. And that's why we study the Four Noble Truths. Um, and the Four Noble Truths and, and the understanding of them solely at the first turning of the wheel will allow us to learn how to have freedom from fear altogether how to get rid of cyclic existence altogether. So what we fear is, is cyclic existence. At, at the medium scope level, that's what we're, we're fearing. That's what we're definitely wanting to emerge from is cyclic existence. And so we can have that fearlessness, right? Uh, if we want it. A, a lesser vehicle practitioner, a medium scope practitioner can have that fearlessness, but they do not have infinite happiness. It would seem like, oh, if you didn't have any fears, you'd have infinite happiness but they don't have infinite happiness. They don't have an infinite ability to help others. Why? 
Because if you only get rid of the afflictive obstructions and get rid of those things that cause our fears, get rid of those things that cause cyclic existence, then you will abide in what's called abiding nirvana and you'll have freedom from fears. But if you don't figure out how to build on that and how to turn that into an infinite form of happiness and omniscience, you still are incomplete. You still haven't satisfied your own needs because you have what are called the imprints of the afflictive obstructions. They're called the cognitive obstructions. And you certainly haven't taken care of the needs of others because you aren't omniscient. You don't know how to help all sentient beings. So you aren't complete because you still have obstructions to omniscience. You, you've gotten rid of the afflictive obstructions, but you still have imprints of the obstructions to omniscience. So you're incomplete. You haven't fulfilled your needs and you haven't fulfilled all sentient beings needs uh, because you can't help them in a complete way. You can't show them how to arrive at a state for themselves that is free from suffering and has infinite happiness. So what, what was missing in the medium scope practitioner's practice? They realize emptiness directly, they know the nature of reality, they know what caused suffering, they ended what caused suffering uh, through a path, through a superior path. Um, what didn't allow them to hit the mark of Buddhahood? Um, what didn't allow them to hit the mark of Buddhahood was that those imprints were still left over. And why? Because the self-cherishing attitude was never completely abandoned. The grasping at the self as being truly established was abandoned, but not the grasping at, at the, not the self-centered grasping, not the self-cherishing mind that grasps oneself and cherishes oneself more than any, anything else or anyone else. The self-cherishing mind, the selfish mind um, was still present. And if it's still present, then you can't be omniscient and you can't have infinite happiness. Um, so what would require, what would be required to get rid of a self-cherishing mind? Um, and what would be required would be to become a Buddha because the Buddha is the only one who has no traces of self-cherishing mind uh, left whatsoever. So if by understanding the three highest higher trainings as we've been taught before and understanding the four noble truths and uh, so forth is what one practices to get rid of cyclic existence, then what does one have to do to become a Buddha? How does one get rid of the obstructions to omniscience? One has to develop love and compassion for all sentient beings. This number that we can't count, this, this, this countless sentient beings, uh, one has to develop love and compassion for them. And then eventually from that love and compassion have this infinite desire to become a Buddha for their sake. This, this, this desire that's so big, this huge mind that wants to become a Buddha for their sake. So how does that happen? Well, that's why we're here this evening. <laughs> we're here this evening to figure out how we ourselves can generate that mind. So assuming we've arrived at a point where we have renunciation, um, how would we then go from renunciation to uh, a, a mind that could turn into a Buddha, right? So the renunciation is necessary to turn into a Buddha as well. Um, because renunciation, which is a desire for yourself to get out of cyclic existence, must be present to become a Buddha. But then what you do is you take that desire to get out of cyclic existence for yourself, and you make it just as important in your mind for everyone else to get out of cyclic existence and become a Buddha. So you're becoming a Buddha for their sake, so that they can have eternal happiness and be free from all, all types of, of suffering, freedom from all types of fear, have the four types of fearlessness. So in order for that to occur from the state of renunciation, if some a practitioner has realized up to the point of renunciation where they wanna get out of cyclic existence, there are various practices that have to be practiced as we've learned about. Um, so when we look at the general meaning of perfection, 
and that shows you what bodhicitta is and how you get bodhicitta and why you would want to get bodhicitta and so forth. We see it breaks it down into five categories. We've gone over this a bunch, uh, but it's important that we go over, you know, just the outline each time so that we can have it fresh in our minds. So first we have the categories of basis. Uh, then we have the category of causes. That's the section that we're currently in. We went over general causes and we're getting into the specific root causes and we're halfway through one of the specific root causes. Um, and, and then we get into nature uh, and then we get into divisions and then the benefits. So there's five categories altogether uh, in Pension Sunandrapa's uh, General Meaning Perfection uh, Awakening Mind uh, section. And, and uh, so we went over basis. What kind of basis would you need mentally and physically to get aspiring and engaged bodhicitta? So we went over that extensively. And I think everybody understands that pretty well. We went over the general causes, conditions, and powers that are necessary in order for one to uh, achieve the mind that aspires to enlightenment in that second section of causes. And now we're going to get into the specific causes, the specific root causes uh, that will allow one to get bodhicitta. And we said that there were two lineages of specific root causes. First, the lineage uh, from Lord Buddha to Maitreya to Asanga and so forth, which was called the extensive deeds lineage. Uh, and this was the seven point cause and effect instruction for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment. And then the second lineage of instruction was called equalizing and exchanging self with others. And this lineage was passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Manjushri to Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna Shantideva, uh, et cetera. Uh, and this is from the profound view lineage, uh, that that's what that lineage is called. So we've been talking about the seven point cause and effect. Uh, and we talked extensively about the pre-step uh, for the seven point cause and effect of getting the mind that aspires to enlightenment, which was equanimity. Uh, so we learned that if we put it all together in terms of the seven point cause and effect, you would first develop this in equanimity or impartiality towards uh, sentient beings, an equal desire to want to benefit them. Uh, then you would generate the three causes, which were causes that were making you have more affection for them, of recognizing sentient beings as your all beings as your mother, remembering their kindness and wishing to repay their kindness. Uh, so those are the the points that we've we've gone through so far. Uh, and then the next three causes that we get into are the de development and attitude that's intent on others' welfare. So we become we find that we have affection for these beings, and then we become intent on their welfare. And then we engage in the next three causes, which are love through the force of attraction, great compassion, the extraordinary attitude. And these are the six causes that allow for the arisal of the seventh step, which is the result, which is bodhicitta. So the seven point cause and effect has six causes and one result making for a total of seven. That's why it's called seven. Um, and then we have a pre-step, which is equanimity, which is developing this impartiality towards our friends, enemies, and neutrals. We have to start from this foundation where we would be willing to equally help our friends, enemies, and neutrals if we were going to then try to develop affection for them and see them all as our mothers and so forth. Uh, so we saw where we left off last time, we were talking about, uh, you know, love, uh, get what, what gets us up to love uh, through the force of attraction, and that's affection. Um, so we had we'd spoken about developing this understanding that all sentient beings are our mother, and using the various lines of reasoning to establish that, recognizing that we've had beginningless lives, that our consciousness came from a previous consciousness that came from a previous consciousness. And we can trace that back moment by moment. And we'll find that we can trace it to the moment we're born, but there's still something that caused that moment, that birth moments of consciousness. And it has to be something from a similar class. Non-consciousness can't cause consciousness. Matter can't cause consciousness. You know, things with particles can't cause consciousness because we see that consciousness is clear and knowing and isn't made up of particles like matter. So it has to, consciousness had to be caused by consciousness. It couldn't be caused by non-consciousness and it had to be caused by a concordant consciousness. It couldn't be caused by a per perfect consciousness if it wasn't a perfect consciousness. So the previous moments of consciousness had to be a light consciousness consciousness altogether, uh, or that consciousness that was causing it would load, right, the, the, the current consciousness with its contents. Um, so 
the previous consciousness that we are experiencing is from our own continuums of previous consciousnesses and consciousnesses and consciousnesses. And what are the experiences that we're having? They're from previous virtues and non-virtues that we've, we've uh, engaged in that have left imprints in our mind ready to ripen. So we have these previous lives and in previous lives, we've created previous actions. Virtuous actions lead, lead to happiness, non-virtuous actions lead to suffering. So then as we, we move backwards, we see this beginningless nature. As we move forward, we see what was behind us is creating everything we experience. So we see that everything that we've done before is creating now, is creating the experience of now. So when Lord Atisha says to throw away this life, he's not saying, you know, go live in a gutter. Lord Atisha is saying this life is already baked for the most part. You will rarely create any karma during your lifetime that will be so big that it'll produce results in this lifetime. Most of the stuff that we're doing will produce results in future lifetimes, unless we're really fast tracking and become a Buddha in this lifetime. Very, very rare. Most of the time we're creating causes for our immediate next life or lifetimes, a million lifetimes later, possibly. Uh, so most of the karmas that we're engaging in are those kind of karmas. Uh, so Lord Atisha said, throw away this life. What do you mean by that? Look towards your future because this has already been baked in most circumstances. And why? Because since beginningless time, we've had this consciousness that was caused by a previous consciousness that was caused by a previous consciousness that inhabited aggregates. And this consciousness inhabited this grasping at an eye, this grasping at true establishment that then grasp at these parts in this environment as having some true existence and then reacted accordingly, became attached, acted badly, became angry, acted badly, sometimes acted good and planted seeds for us to be happy, acted very badly a lot, planted more seeds us to be, for us to be unhappy. And this is what is cyclic existence, the circle that's going over and over again. This beginningless lives, this beginningless consciousness uh, that's inhabited beings that have acted because of the grasping at true establishment and because of the self-cherishing attitude in bad ways and cause this to happen again and again and again and again. We've never ever purified our minds. So therefore I am. <laughs> therefore Jeff is here. Prove it. I'm here and I'm ignorant. I'm not omniscient. I haven't ripened my mind. Um, so uh, it, it has to be ripened, um, and, and we have to cultivate it through this way. Um, so uh, we, we get to this step where we can recognize begin our mothers, all beings as our mothers, uh, because we're establishing all of these different points, and we're establishing how we have behaved so differently in all these different lives towards even the sentient beings that we're so kind to right now. Uh, in the Lam Rim, it says we've cut off their heads in previous lives. We've murdered them. We've been terrible to these sentient beings that we're so kind to right now. Um, so it allows us when we look at karma and how things arise and how sentient beings like ourselves have mental consciousness that's beginningless uh, and we interact with them now. Um, and when we, previously we weren't the same exact person as they weren't and different karmas were coming up and different uh, negativities and, and were coming up because of all the varieties of karmas we created. Uh, so karmas can be the action. Karma is just a Sanskrit word that means action. Action of our mind, action of our body and action of our speech. Really the Abhidharma says that it's the action of the mind that, you know, it's the intention of the mind uh, that causes really, it's the, the, the body and the speech that acts out the most. Um, but it's being driven by that, that mind. So we have to think about all these things and understand karma, understand the 12 links of dependent origination, or understand how this existence comes about being uh, in order for us to believe that all sentient beings are our mother. And if we can get to the point where we believe that all sentient beings are our mother, it says starting with our friends, then moving to strangers or neutrals, and then moving to our enemies, if we can get to the point where we see all sentient beings as our mother, we will encounter an ant and say, I'm your child. Um, and we won't have any bias in that kind of experience. It won't take us any kind of reasoning to, to think like that. It will just spontaneously happen. So imagine 
and we're thinking about it in terms of a vulnerable child, right? We're thinking, oh, I've been so vulnerable and you've taken such good care of me. Uh, that's what we would spontaneously think when we saw every being. Imagine how differently we would react to them if we thought in that way. And so that's why we start to build up affection by recognizing sentient beings as our mothers, as our closest loved ones, as our friends, uh, as any relationship that we can think of that's so, so close and so, so loving. Every sentient being we've had that relationship with. So it says in the Lam Rim Chemo, and uh, it, it says in Pabunka Rinpoche's text that we need to understand that they've been our, our brothers and our sisters. And uh, in Asanga's text uh, also, uh, it speaks about that in the Bodhisattva levels um, about seeing sentient beings in all of those different ways. And then when we look at the um, Lankavatara Sutra, it also talks about sentient beings having all of those relationships with us. And in that same sutra, that's where it, the Buddha forbids his practitioners from eating meat. Very interesting. Other sutras, he said, if you have to, if it's the only thing that's put into your vessel, you, you eat what you can and you look at it in a, in a way with a, a positive motivation. Um, but the Buddha said that if it's in your hands, uh, my, my students don't eat meat because every sentient being has been your mother, your brother, and your sister. Uh, and it's and it's by this violent act of eating your your mothers uh, that causes cyclic existence to go around and around and around. And it makes sense if you're looking at all sentient beings as your mother, and you would encounter an ant and say, "Oh, I'm your child." How would you eat that eat that being? It wouldn't make any sense. There's no logical sense to that. Uh, so this is why the Buddha says what he says. He doesn't just say things to make rules. Uh, to try to be difficult. There's logic behind everything that the Buddha says. Uh, so the next thing we do is remember the kindness that sentient beings have shown us. Uh, we remember all of the, the kindness that you know our mothers have shown us in this life and other sentient beings have shown us in this life. Uh, and we think about how vulnerable we were and how we needed someone to protect us. We needed at some point in time when we came into this world, uh, people who cared for us and took care of us uh, when no one knew who we were but those few people, and they put all they could into taking care of us. Uh, and all sentient beings have played that role for us. And we think of that kindness that they've showed us, how wonderful it is they've been that kind. Um, and then when we have realized this and we come upon an ant, we say, oh, you've been my mother and been so kind to me. So we, we Last week, we were talking about how does this apply into daily life? Well, think about if you came into contact, if you meditated over and over and over on this enough that every being you came in contact with, even at this second causal step of the six, you're starting to be able to see these beings as so kind to you. Imagine how you would react to them differently. Imagine how you would think before you re would react each time you encountered that person, even if they were being mean to you, you might think, oh my gosh, they're, they're under the control of these karma and afflictions and delusions and they've been so kind to me. Uh, I need to do something, right? Uh, you wouldn't react by yelling and screaming at them. You'd react with love. And if you have love in your mind, the feeling that's created is happiness in your mind. And happiness draws you towards, right? Draws you towards that being to help them. Imagine how different it would be if you had love for a being and it drawed you to them to want them to be happy, right? Imagine how different that would be. It would be a totally a different relationship you'd have with them. Um, so you start to see each being to have this kindness uh, and remember, you remember it. And how would you go about repaying uh, a kindness uh, that sentient beings have given to you? Um, how would you ultimately be able to make them happy um, if you recognize now, as we do, that even the, the, the forms of happiness that we encounter are actually termed suffering? When we look at, look at them, when we look at technically the forms of happiness that we encounter, they're called the suffering of change. They're the bait that keep us in cyclic existence that have a self-destruct mechanism within them that eventually turn into suffering and make us completely dissatisfied with them. Uh, so, so how would we make our, our, all these beings who have been our mothers uh, um, happy? I mean, how, how could we repay this kindness that they've shown us? Um, you know, no matter how much wealth we could give them, uh, just like Buddha Shakyamuni understood, 
motivated by great compassion. When we look at Dignaga's text, uh, and it says that um, he became a reliable guide, motivated by great compassion. Um, uh, you know, um, why, why, why would we not be satisfied uh, with with just giving them some sort of wealth or happiness in cyclic existence? For the same reason that Buddha didn't want to just stay a prince. Because as a prince, you can give every, everybody all kinds of stuff, right? But you can't give them freedom from fear and infinite happiness. You can't show them how to get that unless you're there, unless you know how to get that. So the Buddha recognized that just giving these sentient beings, you know, some kind of uh, small token wasn't going to be enough. Um, and, and, and not only would that not be enough, but I've created so many problems for these beings at times. At times I thought I was helping them and gave them things that hurt them more because I'm not omniscient. At times I hurt them so badly because I saw them as enemies. It says now what else is there other than nirvana to repay with the with uh, uh, the help of those who in other lives help me with love and service. In many lives, we it says in Baba Vega's heart uh, of the middle way, it says, furthermore, like applying salt to the wounds of those who have been possessed by the madness of their afflictions, I created suffering for those who were sick with suffering. So I've hurt beings. I've created more suffering for them in the past, even by doing things I thought were helping them. So now what else is there other than nirvana to repay the help of those who in other lives help me with love and service? If I could bring them to a state of fearlessness that had infinite happiness, then that would be the real way that I could repay them. So we look at this, you know, uh, it, right now, all these sentient beings are like they've been crazed and are blind and have no guides whatsoever. It says, if they can't place hope on their own child, who can they place hope in? So we have this affection that's built up and this affection says, we've got to repay this kindness of them. We have so much affection for them. We want to repay the kindness of them. So how would we do them? do that for them, if we could bring them to happiness. So that's the next step. So we see that these steps of affection, these steps of causing us to have affection, these three steps lead up to love through the force of attraction. And that love through the force of attraction is brought about by affection. That's why we're attracted, you know, like mag these beings, be we're like a magnet to them. We're attracted to them because we have affection for them. Just like a, a mother has for their child, has affection for that small child, we have affection now for all sentient beings. We see them as our mothers. We have, we're, we have affection like the small child has for his or her mother, for all sentient beings. And we say, we wish we could repay their kindness in some way. And we know the only way that we can repay their kindness is if we can get them to be infinitely happy and be free from fear. So when we get to this step of love and love is wishing that sentient beings have happiness uh, and the causes of happiness, um, we have to have affection for those beings. We have to, and when we look at the object of observation of all of these meditations, it's all sentient beings. It's not some, most, Almost all, it's all sentient beings. So we have to have a handle on our relationship with friends, enemies, and neutrals. We have to have a very, very solid handle on that uh, and have that equal desire to benefit, you know, equally see them all as our mothers and as kind and as objects we wish to repay the kindness to and have, that we have affection for um, so that we can then get to the point where intent on their welfare, uh, where we want them uh, to have happiness. So being intent on their welfare begins with wishing that they have happiness. So when we go to the Lamrim Chemo, uh, and then we look at also uh, 
commentaries on the four immeasurables, uh, we see very, very similar points being made. So let's take a look at that. What's the object of our love? What is the object of observation of our love? So it says, uh, you know, the four immeasurables, that line says, may all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. So what's the object of observation of love? It's living beings who do not have happiness. So we're saying, may they have happiness. So it's living beings who do not have infinite happiness. So our object of observation of our love in this meditation, the sentient beings who do not have infinite happiness. Uh, so the Lam Rim Chemo says that the object of the love is sentient beings who do not have happiness. And the subjective aspects are thinking how nice it would be if, uh, if beings were happy. So when we look at the commentary on the four immeasurables, it's the same exact thing. May all sentient beings have happiness and the ha causes of happiness how nice it would be if they were happy. So we start to think how nice it would be if our friends, enemies, and neutrals uh, could be happy. So it's actually not that order. So we start with our, our friends, how nice it would be if our friends could be happy, how nice it could be if strangers could be happy, how nice it could be uh, if enemies could be happy, uh, how nice it could be if all sentient beings could be happy. Um, so we actually add this all sentient beings because strangers, when we think about strangers, we can think about specific individuals that we don't really know, but we'll run out of them and then we'll have to, we'll run out of friends, enemies, and neutrals that we can actually cognize, that we can actually think about as sentient beings. And then we're going to have to just expand it uh, into, you know, and all sentient beings, right? We start out with these very specific topics, but eventually because we aren't omniscient and can cognize all sentient beings, uh, uh, we are going to have to use images of them to the point until we can cognize all of them. But we start with our friends, then we move to our stra strangers that we, we've seen around, right? Neutrals, uh, people that are neutral to us is a, a, maybe a better way because uh, to say it, uh, it's what the Lam Rim Chemo translates, committee translated as uh, neutrals. Uh, and then our uh, um, enemies and then all other sentient beings. Um, uh, so this is the, the object of observation. So you start with this, may our, my friends, uh, how nice it would be uh, uh, if my friends were happy, if my neutral, people neutral to me were happy, uh, and if my enemies were happy, and if all sentient beings were happy. Um, and then we move on to the next level. Um, may all sentient beings uh, be happy. Uh, so may they be happy. So we say, may, we, we say, may they be happy. You know, how nice it would be that my friends, strangers and uh, enemies and the, all sentient beings are happy. Then we say, may they be happy. It's firmer, right? May they be happy. Then we say, I will cause them to be happy. So now we're saying, I'll cause this to happen. Um, so we get to the point where uh, if we, you know, come into contact with an ant, right? We can apply the same thing. We see they're our mother, they've been kind to us, we wanna repay their kindness and we uh, wish you know, they were happy. Um, um, uh, um, and we'd see every single being uh, in this, this kind of equal way. We'd want them to be happy and we'd say, I'm gonna take it upon myself uh, um, to, to make you happy. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm, I will cause you to be happy. But it doesn't go further than there. It, you know, it, it doesn't actually say I'm going to take it upon myself. So uh, it kind of infers that, but it's, it just says at this point, I'll cause you to be happy. I will do that. Um, so you're getting this resolve in your mind. May all sentient beings have, uh, may all sentient beings who are my friends, strangers, uh, and enemies, and all other sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. Uh, how nice it would be if they were happy. You think about that and you revel in the fact how nice it would be if my friends, strangers, enemies, and all of the sentient beings were happy. Um, may they be happy. I'll cause them to be happy. Um, so if you have that conviction about all mother sentient beings, then you have this um, love through the force of attraction. And the object of observation, again, is all sentient beings. Um, so it's very, very vast object of observation. Um, so, uh, and, it, and it talks about the great, great benefit all over the place of meditating on, uh, on love. 
uh, and, and the stages are as follows. So the Lamrim Chemo, I'm just going to read it, um, but I believe that it says the same thing that uh, I've just been presenting. Uh, I know that it says the same thing, but it's good to just read the text and just make sure. The stages of cultivating love are as follows. First, cultivate love towards your friends. Then cultivate love, love towards persons uh, who you have neutral feelings. Then next, cultivate love towards your enemies. Then cultivate it gradually toward all beings. And as you become uh, a more and more realized bodhisattva, you know, once you get bodhicitta, you become a bodhisattva. Uh, as you become more and more realized as a bodhisattva, you'll be able to um, see more sentient beings and you'll be able to travel to other worlds uh, and actually see uh, more beings and, and, and cognize more beings than we can now. So the number will, will, will get greater. And it says, just as you develop, uh, can develop compassion once you have repeatedly thought about how living beings are made miserable by suffering, develop love by thinking repeatedly how living beings lack all happiness, both contaminated and non-contaminated. And then you, when you become familiar with this, you will naturally wish for beings uh, to be happy. Um, and then it says, bring to mind all forms of happiness, mundane and, and not non-mundane uh, that you can possibly think of and imagine you're offering them to all sentient beings, all forms of happiness, you know, even in the form of a mundane happiness, you know, uh, giving them a better job or making sure that they have money or, you know, all of these mundane happinesses, uh, you know, so they're comfortable enough uh, to be able to have the superb happinesses, the infinite happinesses. So imagine you're giving them all the different forms of happiness that you can give them uh, in your mind. So it says, bring to mind various forms of happiness and then offer it to living beings. Uh, so you're seeing, once you're familiar with this, you wish that every being could be happy and then happiness. Test it. Imagine you're giving all your friends these different forms of happiness, giving all the strangers, neutral beings, these different forms of happiness. Imagine that you're giving all your enemies and then all sentient beings these different forms of happiness mentally and see if there's this kind of impartiality going on. Uh, see what you need to work on. Use the mirror of the Dharma. The Dharma said you're going to react differently when you think of a friend and an enemy. See if that's still happening. See if you can close that gap and that divide. See how, how, how much further you have to go to close that gap. And that you're the only one who can tell that story. I can't tell that story for you. I can tell the story for myself, but I can really only tell it to myself because I, you know, I can only know my own mind and what it was like last week or the week before versus now. I could tell you. And then whether you believe me or not, you know, you have to depend upon me telling you the exact truth. And if I have a little ego in there, maybe I'm not telling you the exact truth. So don't worry about my mind. Worry about your mind and what, what's happening to it. Are these teachings changing it? Are you becoming more compassionate? Are you becoming more loving? Are you more likely than you were before you had these teachings to encounter a being and say, okay, uh, they've been kind to me in the past and, and, and I, maybe I should react a little bit differently. Is there any part of that coming up at any point in your interaction? Even if it's afterwards, after you yelled, are you regretting it because you're recognizing, man, they were kind to me before? It isn't always, you know, oh, did I stop it right then? If you're regretting it, you're making progress. So don't be so hard on yourself all the time and think like, oh, I didn't do it perfect again. Only the Buddha can do it perfect. That's what we're aiming for. We're aiming towards perfection, but we're going to screw this up terribly over and over and over again. And if you get hung up in the screwing it up terribly part, then you have some weird ego thinking that you couldn't screw it up because you're already enlightened or something. The Buddha said we were going to. The tenant system said that there's all this stuff you believe that's wrong you don't even know about that you believe until you start digging around in these, these tenets and start digging around in your mind. You start seeing how your mind actually reacts to an object. When you look at, look at the low rig and you look at the omnipresent mental factors and you see how your mind reacts to an object and, and you see 
How? Okay, I come in contact with an object and I focus in on this object. Then I discriminate it. Oh, oh, it's this, oh, it's ugly or it's that, or it's this. And if it's something I don't like, uh, then I have a yucky feeling about it. You know, this is the stages that happen. And then this yucky feeling causes some sort of intention. If it's something I don't like, I push it away. If it's something I love, I grasp towards it. If I can't push it away, I dwell in stress and anxiety and depression. If I can't get what I want and be happy, I dwell in anxiety, stress, and depression because my mind is, 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 this in, this, is stuck. It wants to push away the, the thing I don't like and it wants to grab the thing I like. So I'm constantly, because of the way I'm discriminating things, creating circumstances for me to grasp at things and push things away because I'm not paying attention enough to things sometimes. I'm not, the object of observation of my awareness isn't clear because I have all this distortion and I have all this grasping and this self-cherishing and self-centeredness. So if I could, weaken those ignorances and weaken that, that self-cherishing attitude, that self-centeredness, then I'd be able to have a clearer mind to discriminate things I encounter better. That's why all these technical things are so important. How would you know why you were doing something, how to stop what you're doing, what the cause of what you're doing is? I'm acting out because of how I'm apprehending what I'm apprehending. But if you don't know you're acting out because of what the way you're apprehending something and you're acting out and it's causing you to suffer because you're apprehending something incorrectly, then how could you correct it? How could you change your circumstances? How could you ever, ever not just create the same thing over and over again? It takes the wisdom and the understanding to know how our mind works, why it's working the way it is and change it so that we can change it. And it takes these practices in order to change it. So it's very interesting. It takes all of this stuff in order to start to have this evolution of our mind where we become more and more happy, have more happiness to give, right? We become more and more compassionate. So we want to give more happiness. We become more and more compassionate. We have more and more love for beings. So we want them to have happiness. We want them to be free from suffering. So when we encounter them, we aren't thinking about what we can get from them or why they aren't behaving the way they want, we want them to. We can think about how we can help them. That will be the only thing on our mind. Something's coming at us, ah, blah, 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 yelling. And we think, how can we help this person? And it isn't always by saying, oh, it's okay, you're yelling. Sometimes it's saying, don't yell like that and get away from me that can be compassionate too. They're creating non-virtue. If my mind can't handle that, I'm creating non-virtue by reacting and having improper mental conduct. Sometimes we have to separate ourselves. And sometimes compassion has to be skillful. We don't have to ha have stupid compassion. The Dalai Lama said, if you're getting chased by an angry dog, don't stop and go, Oh, may you have happiness and the cause of happiness and compassion. May you be free from suffering because while you're getting those sentences out, you're going to start getting mauled. <laughs> you have to, you know, be able to use your brain when you're using discrimination and you're trying to develop compassion for all sentient beings. Um, and you have to, even a Buddha or even a Bodhisattva who has clairvoyance who would give his body would make that decision based on is this the best thing to do for that being? Is this, is this what will really, really help that being uh, out um, at this very time? Um, so we have to develop these qualities uh, and we have to go through these practices uh, if we want to be free from suffering and we want to be of, of most benefit uh, to all beings. So this is the way that we do it. Um, so that's uh, how we develop this um, love through the force of attraction. Uh, and then we move on to great compassion. Now there's something very interesting and I'm not gonna get into the details about it because I need to work it out for myself also a little bit more, but I wanna put this in your minds because there's something very interesting I learned today uh, from Geshe Aga, uh, from Umzila. And that is that the hearers and solitary realizer superiors have immeasurable compassion. 
You can say have immeasurable love and have immeasurable compassion. So this is very interesting, right? Um, but they don't have great compassion. So if you were to compare the two topics, great compassion, which is this fifth step, fifth cause we're arriving at. If you compare great compassion and immeasurable compassion, there are four permutations. What does that mean? Um, we can get into that another time, but I'll tell you what the permutation it is not necessarily great compassion. Posit that which is immeasurable compassion, but not great compassion. The subject, a henny on a superior's immeasurable compassion. Is that immeasurable compassion? Yes. It's a, it's a compassion within the, the mind of an aria. Is it great compassion? No. Why? Because the object of observation isn't all sentient beings. It's immeasurable for ordinary beings, but a Hinayana aria can't measure all sentient beings. Still immeasurable for us, still an immeasurable, but the object of observation isn't all sentient beings. Very, very interesting, right? So show one then that is a great compassion that's not immeasurable compassion. One would say a dull-witted bodhisattva on the path of accumulation that has not seen emptiness. So a qualification of immeasurable compassion is that one has seen emptiness. The qualification for great compassion is a bodhisattva has great compassion. So a bodhisattva that hasn't seen emptiness is a, an example of a being who has great compassion, but not immeasurable compassion. Show me something that's both an Arya bodhisattva, a bodhisattva superior, a bodhisattva who's seen emptiness, has immeasurable compassion, and has great compassion. And then something which is neither, you could say, a, a, a car. <laughs> so those are the four, four, four things. So when you hear immeasurable compassion, don't you immediately think, oh, it, it's, it's a, the compassion of the Mahayana. Very interesting. Penchinson Andrapa says no, that hearers and solitary realizers, superiors, get immeasurable compassion. So the details, the technicalities behind that uh, are a lot, but interesting, right? The Hinayana hearer and solitary realizers, their mind is not big enough. Even though it's bigger than we can imagine, it's immeasurable for us. It's still the Buddha's object of observation, all sentient beings is immeasurable for them. So does that make sense? So. A hearer and solitary realizes great, uh, I'm sorry, immeasurable compassion is not as big as the compassion that a, a, a superior bodhisattva has because the object of observation isn't as big because the, the Mahayanas, the bodhisattva is looking at all sentient beings and the hearer is limited in their object of observation because of, well, if we look at merit, is one thing, uh, and the self-cherishing attitude, uh, which disallows that that um, that ability uh, and that that aim, that that aspiration that is for everyone uh, uh, to become a Buddha for everyone. Um, so it's very interesting. Immeasurable does not mean everyone in every case. Uh, so as we read technical texts, we need to know technical things. And I thought that that was a very interesting point that was made. Uh, that a hearer, a solitary realizer um, in the, um, in, in the uh, um, Hinayanas, right? Realization, hearer and solitary realizer has a measure, measurable uh, compassion, but not great compassion. And if you look at what it says in Illuminating the Intent, Lama Tsongkhapa Zuma Gomba Rapsel, 
uh, it talks about the hearers and solitary realizers hear the Mahayana Dharma. Um, they just don't have the merit that's necessary to become fully enlightened Buddhists. They don't, uh, they could even teach it, uh, but they don't practice it to the fullest point. And that's another interesting thing. A Prachika Buddha is a little bit higher than a hearer because they have a little bit more accumulation of merit um, than the hearer, but not enough, not as much as the, the Bodhisattva, um, uh, as the Buddha uh, needed to accumulate. Um, so they haven't accumulated all that's necessary uh, to become a Buddha. Um, and because that accumulation is missing, all kinds of things are missing, such as the object of observation of their immeasurable compassion is not all sentient beings. Um, so on that technical note, uh, maybe we'll end there. Uh, we won't get into um, compassion because that requires us to talk a, a lot about suffering um, because when we want uh, um, all sentient beings to be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. Um, and our object of observation is sentient beings who suffer. Uh, we have to think about how they suffer and, 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 and so forth. So we'll have to get into those details uh, more later. Um, so what I'll end with is the, the, when we look at immeasurable loving kindness, and in this case, we're looking at it from the great vehicle perspective, this great compassion that the the immeasurable part refers to all sentient beings. Uh, when we look at the meditation on that, uh, there's a beautiful meditation that we can do uh, and we can apply it to all the immeasurables, um, but let's just run through it real quickly so we can hear it in our ears just once. Um, and this is from Tibet House. Uh, um, part of it is, the other part is just from all of the Lamrim meditations, but there's another part uh, which uh, um, is specific uh, the Tibet house pulled from somewhere um, that I hadn't seen before and I found beautiful. So, um, so first of all, you say, may all sentient beings have happiness in the causes of happiness. How good it would be if all beings were endowed with happiness in the causes of happiness, primarily bodhicitta, which cherishes others more than oneself and the wisdom of emptiness and dependent origination. May all beings be endowed with happiness in the causes of happiness. I take responsibility that all beings are endowed with happiness in the causes of happiness. Gurus, Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas, please bless me to be able to do so. So you, you visualize all the gurus, the Buddhas, and Bodhisattvas are so pleased uh, with this commitment that you've made. And you imagine that they send forth all these nectars and lights uh, from their omniscient minds that touch you and all sentient beings around you. So you imagine that all sentient beings are around you, uh, that you're imagining, and you imagine that the omniscient minds are touching all of these beings. And out of a great joy of seeing all beings benefit, you take three deep breaths, exhaling with a sigh of relief at the end of each breath. That you take this deep breath, that the Buddhas are, 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 are giving, uh, uh, touching all sentient beings and granting immeasurable happiness and the causes of happiness. Um, and, and you are one of those sentient beings. Just imagine that uh, this is all occurring. So we'll go over this another time uh, also, but I thought it'd be nice to, to think about that, that you take these deep breaths and you exhale, like you're relieved um, that these beings are getting happiness, right? Uh, that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are emitting all these light rays and nectars and going down to all beings. Uh, and, and then what, it, what is happening? It's, it's bringing all beings to, to happiness caused by what? Caused by bodhicitta, caused by the wisdom realizing emptiness. Those beings will have to get bodhicitta. Those beings will have to realize emptiness in order to have freedom from fear, freedom from all cyclic existence uh, and infinite happiness. So imagine that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are giving them all of those things. We know they can't give them to them, but they can teach them to them. So imagine that it's a speeded up process. <gasps> imagine that it's just going really, really quick. Like the Buddhas are giving them the teaching. It's a speeded up process that instantaneously matures them. Imagine that they are going through like a hyper speed practice that's necessary. The Teata Om Gate Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, Bodhisoha. Imagine that that went, took place in hyper speed and that those beings got bodhicitta and then practice the wisdom realizing emptiness and united the two and then had freedom from all suffering and had all infinite happiness. Um, so when we're doing visualizations, it's not like the Buddha is just raining blessings that you know, allow magic to happen. 
We know the Buddha doesn't wash away the sins with water. The Buddha doesn't remove suffering with his hands. The, the Buddha doesn't transfer realization. So the Buddha certainly isn't raining realizations light rays, right? Um, but we're imagining it out of the greatness of the Buddha. And then we know that the Buddha is the only one who can teach the truth so that we can free ourselves. So we imagine that that process is being speeded up for all sentient beings and, and that everybody, because our aim is for them to be happy, is no longer an object that is a sentient being that's not happy. So we take three sides of relief. We're relieved that they are no longer unhappy. And we can apply that to the other uh, um, four immeasurables too. Um, so uh, I, this isn't me teaching a meditation. It's just a meditation I saw that I thought was beautiful uh, that I thought you might find beautiful too. Um, so we're looking, we're saying this object of observation, the sentient being that uh, is not happy, may they have happiness. Um, how nice it would be that they have happiness. May they be happy. I'll cause them to be happy. Um, but don't confuse this with this extraordinary attitude, right? That takes place. It says, I'll take on myself the task of, of freeing each and every one of them um, um, because it's not as strong yet uh, till you get to the point where you have love and compassion. Then you say, you put your foot down and say, I'll do it myself. Um, um, and before that, you're saying, may I cause it? Um, and, and you, it builds up, you know, this, this desire to help, you know, be helpful builds up just like the affection built up this desire to be helpful, uh, builds up. Um, so everything builds on each other and, and we have to learn these things and how these things work in order for it to work. So, um, that's why we go into all these details. Does anybody have any questions this evening? Okay. Wonderful. Um, so, let's read the four immeasurables. I'm sorry, we already read the four immeasurables. I'm clearly not paying attention. Let's read the eight verses for training the mind. I'm going to get it up on the screen sooner or later, I promise. <laughs> um, Eight Verses for Training the Mind by Geshe Langritamba, with the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectively hold others to be supreme from the depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind, and as soon as a disturbing emotion arises, endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I had found a precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer victory to them. When the one whom I benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly and respectfully take upon myself all the harm and suffering of my mothers. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns and by understanding all phenomena is like illusion be released from the bondage of attachment. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon, I imagine this as a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I've collected for the benefit of the teachings and of all sentient beings, and in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lozandrapa to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised to supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness. All powerful Abulgateshvara, Tenzin Jasu, may you stay until samsara's end. In all our lives, may we never be separated from Kensar Geshe Wandak. May we meet with him in whatever form he emanates from the Dharmakaya, whether it be the emanation body or the Sambhokaya, when we see emptiness directly and are able to see him in that form or her in that form. May we create the merit that's necessary to meet with that holy being. And we, we engage in the virtues which allow us to mature into a being like that holy being. 
Thank you, everyone. And real quickly, 